Next up, a talk by Marko Šolajić and Žarko Živanov, reviving the team 011. Hello everyone, I hope that you know why you are here, because this uh, talk is about very, very old hardware that is not used for, I don't know, probably 40, 30 or 40 years. Anyhow, uh, this is about the work that uh, Marco and me did for the last five, six years, on and off working uh, on one of the remaining uh, team uh, 011 machines. So, uh, we will start with a short history. Uh, the machine is made uh, around 86-87 uh, by a team uh, led by Neda Dunic and uh, two more people were included, uh, Milan Tadic and Ljubiša Gavrilović. Uh, somewhere uh, around uh, 87, that project was picked up by Institute Mihailo Pupin, from Belgrade, and they decided to mass-produce the machine for the schools. Uh, at the time, uh, there was a debate uh, which computer should be used in our schools, and uh, there were several projects actually started at the same time, and some schools got one computer, other schools got the other one. Uh, a lot of Belgrade schools got this one here, um, and uh, because all of those computers were uh, incomp incompatible between them, uh, it was uh, well, quite hard to uh, actually make the books about for students to, to learn the programming. Uh, but anyhow, uh, in 87, this machine won the gold plaque at the fair, Uchila 87, or let's say, learning materials, 87. And uh, the next year, a uh, machine actually went into schools and was started to be used, mostly in Belgrade, but some of the uh, machines ended up all over the Serbia. But uh, as I said, mostly Belgrade. Around uh, uh, 1,200 um, 1, units were produced. And uh, most of them were uh, for the schools. I don't know if we had uh, actually uh, any way to buy, to buy them if you are not a school. Uh, at the time, many uh, magazines, computer magazines from Yugoslavia wrote text about this machine, praising it, praising its capabilities, praising its price, and uh, how it could compete with the XT machines that were uh, starting to become popular. But uh, as everything uh, that was compete competing with uh, PC compatibles somewhere around the uh, uh, beginning of the 90s, uh, PC compatibles, all, uh, as you probably know or do not know, actually took over everything. And all other systems, all other architectures were practically thrown away. That includes and uh, remaining machines of this type, and uh, mostly they were either thrown away or disassembled for the parts. Uh, I'm not sure how many of the machines survived until this day. I am personally aware of about six or seven of them. Uh, I don't think that there is more than a 50, 60 of them now alive. And uh, that is not the worst case re regarding the preserving of history of computing. The worst case is with the software written for this machine because none of it survived. Uh, the only thing that survived was just one copy of a system floppy disk uh, that was uh, significantly altered from the uh, system disk that came originally with machine. And that is all that we have uh, today. Uh, from time to time, something pops up, but um, mostly some basic programs somebody photographed uh, from a piece of paper or something like that. Uh, so what's inside the machine? 
It's based around the Hitachi's uh, HD64180 processor. It has 256Ks of RAM. Uh, video output supports four shades of green, that includes black. And uh, it's running a version of CPM operating system. Uh, actually, some the magazines that I mentioned uh, had the uh, series of articles about building this machine by yourself. So you could buy the motherboard, you could buy the parts and assemble it at home. Uh, of course, the case wasn't part of that and the uh, keyboard, uh, you could use another one. But uh, uh, about the de those details, we will talk later. Uh, so, what's that HD64 whatever processor? It is actually a Z80 based embedded microprocessor. Uh, it has Z80 core with added peripherals. So, it has a MMU unit, it has DMA, timers, and so on. But mostly, uh, it is Z80 with uh, also some instructions added. For example, it had uh, instructions for multiplying, which was used in several places in the OS for the machine itself. Uh, Hitachi later licensed that uh, CPU back to Zilog, and uh, Zilog first uh, produced uh, their variant, which was more or less exact copy, only with Z. Uh, in the name, and then with some enhancements, they made the Zilog Z180, and that was maybe something you heard of, if you know what Z80 actually is. Uh, for the rest of the hardware, keyboard is actually a keyboard with serial communication, so it uses, uh, it has its own CPU and APROM and program that runs, and use a serial communication to send data to the motherboard itself. Uh, machine has a floppy drive and the floppy controller based on chips that were available at the time. It has serial parallel ports at the back and the power supply that generates five plus 12 and minus 12 voltages. Uh, for the uh, video output, I will give the word to Marco because he was the one who worked most of the details. Marco. Thank you. Uh, the, if you take a look at the, the monitor, you will see only text. And uh, mostly it was text-based, but uh, the display has full resolution of 512 by 256 pixels with two bits, of, uh, two bits per pixel. Uh, and the video memory is uh, inside the CPU's uh, input output, output space, and uh, it's based from 8,000 hex. The text mode, which is 80 by 24 characters, is actually all realized in software. So software is generating this text. The monitor is a classic 12-inch green monitor. It's fixed to the case, you cannot move it. But uh, if some service is required, uh, the motherboard can be pulled out. So there are four screws on the back. And you pull out the front part of the computer with, where everything is actually fixed to the chassis. Uh, regarding the graphics we will talk about later, but uh, the machine is fully capable of uh, slow but four color graphics. Okay. As for the software, uh, 250K of RAM is used as 60K uh, RAM for the processor, processor itself, and uh, the rest of the memory is used as RAM disk. So uh, you could copy program to RAM disk and run it much faster than you would do from the floppy. Uh, user programs were not actually limited to those for uh, 64K of RAM. But uh, you could call uh, some system function and reserve some part of that 
uh, RAM disk for yourself and use it uh, as uh, any way you want, but you need it to be aware of the memory management unit and need, you need it to handle it yourself. Uh, the CPM operating system that was run on it was uh, actually ZCPR3, which is, uh, uh, let's say, enhancement of the CPM 2.2. Uh, the whole operating system was back then in public domain, meaning uh, more or less open source, and uh, it was uh, highly configurable, so it was adjusted for the uh, hardware that this machine had. Uh, the authors of the machine uh, made a program that actually emulates terminal. Uh, they called it EMU, and uh, that uh, program also draws the characters on the screen. So uh, it, uh, inside it, it is the software implementation of that character screen Marco mentioned. Uh, characters are initially English, Latin, but you could switch the characters to the Cyrillic and then all the output would be in Cyrillic. Uh, for that, uh, you had two uh, programs that actually just rewrote the parts of the RAM that uh, program EMU was uh, using, the part where definitions for the characters were. Uh, you also had the possibility to configure what will be run at boot time, so you could make some programs to run automatically as the machine starts. Uh, since the machine was intended for school use, uh, there were some compilers and interpreters uh, available, uh, mostly GBASIC. Uh, that was uh, standard GBASIC used at the time for CPM, but which added uh, code to handle Teams uh, video capabilities. There was also Turbo Pascal 2.0. Uh, treated in the same way, so they wrote a library that could be uh, used in, from inside Turbo Pascal, so you could write graphical programs. The problem was that uh, you could actually use that library only if you run the program from the Turbo Pascal's IDE itself. <laughs> uh, there was also uh, assembler evolved, so you could write uh, programs in Z80 assembly. Um, since it was running the CPM, uh, many more uh, programming languages were available, but unfortunately uh, the uh, graphic support was written only for GBASIC and that Turbo Pascal, so uh, most of the other software was uh, not that usable on the machine. So, uh, that is the short history about what happened uh, in the past. Uh, so, up until two years ago, there was uh, no emulator for these machines, uh, meaning that uh, anyone who wanted to try out even that one floppy that remained could do it only if it, he had or she had the hardware itself. So if he had the machine itself to run the software on it. Miok uh, Drag Milanovic, I don't know if he's here right now, uh, actually wrote uh, emulator from team, for team a long time ago inside uh, MAME, but uh, that uh, emulation lacked the uh, set 180 specifics. So the emulation of set 180 wasn't uh, quite uh, finished. Uh, mostly it, miss, it was missing the MMU and DMA parts, and that uh, remained like that for a long time. So that was actually the main reason why the emulator wasn't uh, available. Uh, all of that, of course, means that even those who want to tinker something with that software could either uh, hex analyze uh, floppy image or find someone who actually has the machine and to, to try something out. Uh, in the reviews that were in the magazine at the time, uh, the reviewers uh, mentioned that they got with the machine, they got uh, 
uh, operating system sources so they could adjust some settings for the machine and recompile the operating system itself. Uh, the problem is that all those disks were also lost. Uh, I mean, we have the uh, operating system, the main version, but we do not have configuration files that were used for the team, and we do not have source for the custom software that was written. So it is um, kind of hard to, to go back and try to uh, recompile the system at the moment. Uh, as I said, from time to time, uh, someone uh, posts on some forum, hey, I found my software from from team from my high school days. Here's the photograph of the source that I printed out. And uh, those are mostly basic or Pascal programs. But uh, anything uh, more serious is lost. Uh, we know from those uh, magazine articles that there were uh, games developed for the machine. We know that there were some educational software available. But as I said, nothing of that is uh, preserved. And uh, mm, making um, any development for the machine is uh, very, very hard if you do, do not have all of these things. Uh, during uh, period from 2013 to 2018, uh, various people on uh, some retro forum from uh, Serbia, benchmark.rs, uh, tried to document the hardware of the machine, mostly a few of the guys that actually had the machine and uh, uh, were able to analyze what's inside. Uh, they actually made some modifications to the hardware, uh, mostly based for the machines that were made from kits. And they reverse engineered the uh, motherboard, and some of them made their own replicas of the computer. Uh, also, uh, another serial interface was introduced, so you could use the uh, more easily findable uh, uh, XT keyboards for it, so you could uh, actually, if you make a replica of the computer, you could use a keyboard that you can find and uh, interface with it. Uh, so not, not much of the development uh, happened until 2019. Uh, that year, um, that one image that we have of the floppy, was uh, its configuration was made for the uh, CPM Tools library. Uh, CPM Tools is a library that allows you to read and write files from and to various CPM uh, images. Uh, when I say various images, um, the thing with uh, computers that use CPM is that almost uh, every computer had its own way of writing floppy disks. So it was mostly similar, but not the same. Some had uh, different uh, uh, layout of the floppy. Some had some data at the beginning. Some had it at the end, and so on. So they were mostly uh, incompatible between them. Uh, that CPM tools library uh, was made to actually uh, solve that problem by making uh, every floppy uh, configurable. So you have a configuration for every format of the CPM where you can say this thing is here, this thing is here, uh, I don't know, directories over there, and so on. So um, a file like that was made for Teams format, and uh, we were finally been able to copy, uh, to make new images of the floppies, uh, transfer them to the real floppy, and run on the team itself. So we could uh, start to experiment with uh, its software and trying to change things. Uh, also, to uh, ease the process, uh, Bash script was made to easily uh, put files onto an image and extract them back. Uh, next thing uh, that was done, uh, uh, Marco and I, let's say, rediscovered the video organization of the team's memory. Uh, as he said, the memory is uh, located in the IO space of the Z80 processor. 
Uh, that one of the differences between that uh, Hitachi and real Z80 is that Hitachi has uh, 60K of uh, input output space, 64K, sorry. Uh, so the upper part of 32K is actually used for video output. Uh, the memory is organized in a relatively weird way. So uh, you have here a table that gives you locations from uh, 8,000 hex until the end of the addressable memory. And uh, the video memory or is organized by columns of, of four pixels. So a location uh, 8,000 has uh, pixels from 00, zero to 30. So uh, first is the x, second is the, the y coordinate. Uh, over here is how the, uh, each uh, pixel is represented with two bits. So the lowest bit, two bits represent the uh, pixel uh, at x0, the next two bits uh, uh, with x1, x2, and x3. Uh, next location holds the uh, next four bits in the column. So practically until uh, 80FF you have uh, first column of four pixels for the video memory. Then at this address start second column of four pixels and so on. Uh, I haven't seen a video organization like this before, so it was uh, kind of uh, unusual, but uh, one thing that is, um, let's say, uh, interesting is that because of this organization, uh, calculating the address if you have x and y coordinates, it's uh, relatively simple. All you need to do is to divide uh, x coordinate by 4, uh, multiply it by 256, um, 256, then you add y coordinate that actually, uh, I mean, uh, you add y coordinate to the uh, upper part of the address that automatically gives you the uh, row you need to address and then you make a mask to uh, actually address which pixels you want. So uh, it is a strange organization but uh, as I said calculating the address and bits is relatively simple when you know how to uh, go to there. Next, uh, as I mentioned, uh, team on its uh, system disk had two programs, one to set uh, Latin font and one to set Cyrillic font. Uh, in 2021, uh, we analyzed the font structure, that was uh, mostly Marcos' part, and uh, he found where in that uh, executable file the font definition is, and we found uh, how uh, that uh, six by eight uh, characters were actually defined. Then using that information, I made a program that can convert uh, that data into a bitmap and back, so we could actually make our own fonts for the machine. Uh, next thing, uh, uh, we actually didn't have anything to work with because there was no emulator. I found uh, uh, one uh, open source emulator for the CPM called the uh, NCCPM emulator and uh, it, its source code was uh, very well written and uh, I came to the idea to somehow hack the uh, team's video organization into it. So the end result uh, of I think two days uh, trying out various stuff was that uh, if I start that emulator, it could open the X11 window, and inside that window, uh, the graphics uh, uh, would be displayed. Um, actually, what I did was just to in intercept reads and writes to the IO space inside the emulator and uh, interpret those writes as write to a buffer, and then I display the buffer inside. Uh, separate windows. So uh, that allowed me at least to try out uh, addressing the pixels on the team itself. So uh, that was not a real emulator. Uh, the original NCCPM emulator actually emulates just uh, 
processor and the operating system and it runs at the speed that your host machine runs. So uh, it runs uh, very, very fast compar comparing to the actual machines at the time. So I had to put some empirically uh, decided poses inside the drawing itself to get something like drawing speeds of the real team. But as I said, uh, only the screen was emulated and it's not the, the real emulator. Uh, next, uh, we found out uh, Mike's enhanced small C compiler. That is actually a C compiler for the CPM operating system. And we find out that uh, using this compiler, we could compile C programs that could actually run on the real team. Uh, uh, how is compiled used? Well, you run NCCPM emulator. Inside that emulator, you run the compiler and get the binary files out. So, uh, because uh, the original emulator is actually a, a CLI program from command prompt, uh, everything could be written into scripts and automated, so you could write some uh, make-like uh, file to actually compile the source uh, code into binary file, assemble it into floppy image, transfer that image to the emulator and try it out. Uh, since uh, we got that uh, video uh, emulation working, then I was able to actually start to try out some graphical routines for it. Uh, first thing that one of the first things I did was trying to uh, display some tiles on its screen and made a script that could convert PNG images into uh, array data that was included into C programs and uh, used to directly write the, that data into video memory. So I was uh, actually after. Uh, some experimentation, able to draw uh, various uh, characters from uh, games that I found uh, online and uh, were able to, for example, draw Pac-Man and uh, Dizzy and so on. Uh, next thing was trying out to plot lines, pixels, individual pixels and lines. Uh, that compiler that I mentioned had uh, already implemented the graphic library for another uh, computer, CPM computer made by Amstrad, Amstrad PCV, and uh, it had a graphical library that, to, that could drive lines. Uh, I tried that uh, library, written in C, uh, compiled it to team, and uh, actually got the lines drawn. But the problem was that it was very, very slow. Uh, then I decided to do something that uh, I really didn't want to do, and that is to try to write that pixel and line drawing routines in the Z80 assembly. Uh, I'm from the Commodore 64 background and uh, used a lot of uh, 6502 assembly, and I still write it today as something fun that I like to do. And uh, I never actually wrote any Z80 assembly, nor I don't think I uh, ever seen one. So uh, I found some online sources and started to learn it and started to program that uh, routines. And I must say it was. Uh, relatively painful experience for me. Uh, let's say I don't know, do not like Z80 assembly that much, but uh, I managed to make uh, code that is, uh, I don't know, four or five times faster than what was written uh, com from compiled C, and uh, I, I, I was very satisfied with that. Uh, the routines uh, that were initially made for uh, drawing those um, tiles, I also made in assembly. I get, uh, got uh, pretty good speed out of them too. So uh, although uh, writing to IO space with Z80 isn't uh, very fast, uh, using the, these methods we were able to actually make some animations on the team screen. So there was, um, I mean, it, it was fast enough. 
uh, I actually tried to uh, engage some of the Spectrum people that uh, programmed Z80 much more than me to try to optimize the code, but so far there was no interest in that. So uh, that's my self-taught Z80 code is uh, currently the faster there is, and I'm really not a really good Z80 programmer. Uh, next thing. Uh, as I said, uh, Team uses uh, six by eight pixel fonts to display its uh, characters. Uh, since the organization of video memory is that we have uh, four pixels in a row, uh, printing uh, characters that are six pixel wide then includes a lot of shifting if you are trying to write some parts of those characters into Columns. So, uh, in summary, uh, draw, drawing the ch characters on the screen was, uh, let's say, slow. So, uh, I came to the idea to uh, skip that shifting part and to use the 8x8 eight eight characters. So, I will skip the shifting and uh, it turned out that, uh, of course, writing characters that way was much, much faster. So that became team print library that operates uh, with strings in similar fashion that uh, original routines do, but uses this 8x8 eight eight pixels and 8x8 eight eight fonts, and uh, drawing is uh, really, really fast. Uh, in a routine, I also added, someone asked me if I could write uh, characters in verse. So I said, OK, let's try. And it was relatively easy to implement. So uh, you could do a lot of this, that stuff too. Uh, additionally, uh, because we found the archive online that has many ZD Spectrum fonts in PNG format, I also made a, a program that would convert those PNGs into fonts that could be used with this library. So practically, uh, we had a ton of fonts available from that moment on. And then in uh, 2022, Miodrag Milanovic finally came around to finish that uh, 180 implementation inside the MAME emulator and uh, he first tried one other computer that used that processor and that uh, uh, emulation started to work and then he actually finished the uh, Teams emulation and uh, that was um, middle of this year and uh, we finally had the way to uh, actually uh, compile something and run on the emulator and see how it works. So uh, some experiments were made. Uh, I actually finally find out that my simple implementation of, uh, I mean, it's, it's not full implementation, just moving of the sprites for the space invaders worked quite, quite fast on the team. And uh, I was re really uh, concerned about the speed. Uh, also, Marco made uh, another game, he will talk about it. Uh, okay, not, uh, adapted a game, and uh, that game ran uh, pretty well too. But uh, before we continue to that part, we are going to go, ba go back a few years to 2016. Uh, Mark was trying to find out about uh, some internals of the files on that system disk and uh, inside some ZSystem MDL file he found mentions of uh, Micromint SB180 single board computer. So we tried to find out what is that Microbit SB180 and what it is doing inside the Teams uh, system files. It turned out that SB180 is an open source CPM computer that was based on Hitachi's HD64180 processor that used 20, 
uh, 256K of RAM that used the uh, 9266 Focke controller that you had serial parallel port and uh, ZCPR3 OS was used and used serial connection to communicate with the keyboard. So that was quite, quite similar to what Tim does. Also, all the plans for that computer were printed in a uh, byte from September uh, 1985 meaning all the hardware details, all the software was all available. Uh, that uh, back then was called public domain. Today, we would call it open source or open hardware. Next, we find, uh, I think you find out, yeah? yeah? Uh, inside one advert from 1985 in our magazine, there was uh, uh, something, um, made by Institute Mikhailo Pupin, the same institute that actually produced team machines. And that was a terminal for IBM DEC and Honeywell mainframes that used serial keyboard with CDP 1802 processor and had graphics 512 by 256 pixels or 80 by 24 characters. And if you looked at the picture of that machine, it looks very, very, very similar to this theme here. Uh, Marco then analyzed electric schemes of team and uh, SB180, and it turned out that they are, let's say, not identical, but probably 95. 98%. 98% identical. Yeah. So we started to ask ourselves what is exactly that Team 011 computer that was glorified in our magazines at the time as a pinnacle of uh, domestic engineering and uh, programming and, and so on and so on. Uh, any connection between Team and that project from Byte magazine was, uh, as we know of, mentioned only once in, a in our magazine as a side note in an article about some other computer. So uh, actually no one at the time uh, wanted to mention that uh, computer is actually based on open source hardware that was published two years earlier. Um, Generally, I, am, I like open source. All of my projects that I do uh, for me are actually open source. And uh, I think uh, using other people's work that is open source to learn, to adapt, and to make new things is something that is uh, encouraged in the open source community. I mean, it, it is something I guess uh, maybe many of you already did or do. But uh, using someone's work and then representing it as your own and getting praise for that is something that I think is really not okay. Yeah, I, would just, mm, I would just like to add uh, that actually this is not uh, the only project that was uh, done in a similar fashion. Uh, there was also a project from the magazine Moj Mikro uh, which was published in Slovenia but also with a uh, Serbo-Croatian uh, issue. Uh, and they also had a do-it-yourself uh, computer called Moj Mikro Slovenia. But it turned out that also that computer was a clone of a different single board computer called, uh, uh, if I remember co correctly, the Big Board or something like that. Uh, you can Google it. And I, I looked at the, the motherboards and they are the same. And they also haven't mentioned that their computer, which is also CPM 2.2 machine, uh, also has graphics and so on, is a clone of that computer. So probably that was uh, the case with, with uh, other projects that we maybe don't know of. Okay, so if we get all the data that we gathered, uh, what can we say, what is uh, Team 011? So uh, we could say that is the uh, exact clone of the SB180 computer, 
open source project published two years early, earlier. It seems that its graphics, keyboard, and case were taken from the Mikhailo Pupin Institute project that was also made two years earlier. Uh, its operating system was extended uh, with some software to uh, allow usage of the, its video output, and uh, several libraries were written for the uh, GBASIC and Turbo Pascal. Uh, and uh, when you look at that, then you could see that maybe it's not that much done by our people uh, regarding this computer. But uh, the machine was actually used for, I think, at least a period of five, six years in uh, high schools in Belgrade and uh, other parts of Yugoslavia. And uh, that machine was actually uh, something that many of our IT experts today started with. And uh, it is a school computer that is regarded by many with uh, with, uh, let's say, fond memories. I mean, uh, it is a machine where they learn to program. And uh, that is something that defined them at the time, and then they became programmers and uh, IT professionals that they are today. Uh, I will give the word to Marco regarding some uh, experimentation uh, with uh, the team hardware itself. Okay, so since we didn't have the emulator, uh, we could only experiment on a real machine. Uh, I have actually, I got from Jarko a blank motherboard, and I assembled uh, the computer from scratch. And then I wanted to experiment. So I, uh, since we knew that SB180 has the same hardware uh, and everything is the same, I tried to insert the SB180 boot ROM into Team 011. It sort of wanted to work, but uh, it only printed out on the serial port that. Uh, the floppy controller is bad. And that was it. Nothing else. Oh yeah, a few pixels uh, turned on on the screen. Uh, then with Team 011 boot ROM, I tried to, tried to boot uh, from the SB180 uh, boot disk. It would work sometimes. I didn't know why. But then I came to the conclusion, if I first booted from a Team 011 disk, and then uh, put in a SB180 disk, and reset the machine, it would uh, boot up. If I booted, straight, turned on, turned off the machine and on again, and tried to boot from SB180 boot disk, it wouldn't work. I had no clue what happened there. Then I tried to analyze the startup sequence of uh, Team 011's boot disk, and I saw that the first command in the startup sequence must be the initialization of the RAM disk. Uh, if I don't initialize the RAM disk, the machine would crash. It would start looping around somewhere, trying to access the disk, but nothing would happen. Uh, that actually uh, defeated the purpose of the hard disk because on each boot you have to initialize it. If you don't initialize it, uh, then uh, you cannot uh, run the machine. If you try to add commands, uh, because ZCPR3 has uh, flow commands, if you try to add commands to check if the hard disk, uh, if the, the RAM disk is uh, initialized or not, uh, it would also crash. Uh, only if the, if the RAM disk was initialized and then the machine reset, then it would not initialize the RAM disk. And so it would perform the check. If 
the, the RAM disk is not initialized, then nothing. I tried disassembling the, the code for the for the RAM disk initialization command, but uh, there were issues because uh, online disassemblers uh, cannot handle the HD64-180 opcodes. I didn't know what was happening. I saw some uh, trash commands. And then I said, okay, I will probably uh, stay away from that until uh, the emulator works. Then we got the emulator, and MAME has a very nice uh, debugging uh, uh, environment where you can step through the code, where you can set breakpoints, where you can see the entire memory content at one glance. And then I started actually single stepping from address zero to, to, the, 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 to the successful boot. And I found a lot of nasty patches. Uh, because uh, SB180 system and the entire ZCPR3 is available on uh, archive.org and on a few other uh, CPM resource sites, I found the source code for the uh, SB180 boot ROM, and then I compared it to to, uh, to the team boot ROM. Uh, there was a lot of patches. Uh, the system was jumping all over the place, uh, even in an empty uh, so the the busy loop. So waiting for a command, it would go somewhere else and uh, return back. Uh, the main loop was actually patched to support the software terminal. The main loop of the operating system is actually blinking the cursor. Uh, then I found out that the command processor is at address uh, hex B9000. But when you run the, the uh, command to see how much TPA or transient program uh, space you have. Uh, it says that you have uh, 48k, so until C1000 hex. So what was actually happening is that the RAM disk is used as shadow RAM. When you are inside of a program, for example, WordStar, you don't need the command processor. So the program can be loaded over the command processor. Uh, the problem, uh, not, not the problem, the, 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 the secret of initializing the RAM disk is actually copying that command processor to the RAM disk and having a stash there, having a secure copy. Uh, the uh, program was actually copying the part of the memory to the RAM disk created a uh, directory entry in the RAM disk and set the, that uh, directory entry as a system file so no, no program can uh, erase it. And then when you exit a running program, uh, whether it uh, overwrote the command processor or not, the system call for a worm boot was patched so it loads the command processor back from the, the, the shadow RAMs, for, from the uh, uh, RAM disk, and then returns to execute the command processor. So, uh, a lot of things I uh, have done with the analysis, but I cannot cover them here. Uh, but my uh, goals are to document the boot ROM disassembly. Uh, it's actually quite simple. Erase the, the video RAM, check uh, if the disk is inserted. If the disk is inserted, load the first track into memory at 8000 hex and jump there. 
Uh, second goal would be to make sense out of all the patches done, done to the operating system. Uh, I tried following the source code with the uh, disassembly. Uh, I found similarities, uh, but I found some uh, stuff that's not, uh, that still doesn't make any sense to me. And since the ZCPR3 source code is available, I would like to implement all of those uh, patches perhaps more sanely into the OS because the OS has uh, the OS has provisions to do that. It has files where you can uh, say how the terminal emulator is working, to say how uh, how the input and outputs are handled, and so on. And uh, I found that there is a banked portable BIOS for CPM computers, which uh, uses the advantage of the MMU in, inside the processor. So my goal would be to adapt that to Team 011, so we can actually gain uh, more uh, TPA space. We can run uh, larger programs on the machine because you are now limited to 48K. Uh, I found some uh, programs which don't want to run. They, they ask for 56K. And of course, with Jarko's uh, graphics libraries and uh, emulator working and uh, that uh, Mike's small C compiler. I adapted the game which was written by Miguel Garcia uh, for the uh, Amstrad uh, word processors which also run CPM. Uh, and I added the support for Team 011 uh, graphics and used extensively Jarko's libraries for both text, graphics, styles, and everything else, and fonts. Uh, I will demo the game later here. And that is it. Yeah, uh, the game was written in Mike's Enhanced Small C compiler. And yeah, all the graphics assets were uh, converted with Jarko's tools. Okay, uh, we are near the end, and the question uh, regarding the Team 011 is what to do now. Um, generally, Marco, me, and the small retro community that exists in uh, Serbia, we really do not like that uh, uh, practically all software written for that machine is lost. Uh, for example, when we presented the machine at some uh, exhibitions, like this year's Balkon, uh, before we didn't have anything to run on the machine itself. We can show the, the green screen and uh, nothing. Uh, so, uh, what is the only thing that we could do? Well, we could write the new games by ourselves, of course. Uh, so, the current tool chain for, for Team 011 consists of NCCPM emulator that, run, that, could, that we use to run the uh, C compiler. Uh, we have graphics libraries for the team that, that are uh, written for that compiler. Uh, CPM tools library uh, is used to generate uh, floppy images and uh, main team 011 emulator uh, is used to actually run the code. Uh, all of this is integrated again into a bash script that uh, does all of those steps for you. So you just run the script, the script then calls the uh, CPM emulator compiles the program. If at any step there are some errors, it stops, of course. And then uh, generates the floppy image, then runs the emulator, then uses uh, 
uh, simulated key presses to temporarily uh, run emulator at full speed until the point where the game or whatever you are compiling is loaded, then slows the emulator to the 100% speed and then you can test the code. Uh, all of this now takes less than five seconds on my machine, so I can make some changes to the code, run the script, and five seconds later I can see it running. So, uh, in this uh, past few years we came from uh, not having anything for the machine to having at least one tool chain to make new games, programs, or whatever. Um, uh, during my dabbling with retro computers, I found out about uh, uh, one IDE that uses a kind of Pascal language to program a lot of retro computers. And uh, my current plan is to try to adapt all those libraries to that IDE. If I manage to do that, then uh, there will be a quite nice environment to actually write new software, but that is some future work. Uh, here are just uh, links to all the tools. Uh, all the tools are uh, mentioned at my repository for Team 011 tools, uh, and uh, all the scripts that I mentioned are actually there. So that concludes this talk. Do you have any questions or do you just want some club mate to <laughs> and go to the next one? Uh, uh, Institute Mikhail Pupin exists today also. Uh -huh. Is it really possible that they didn't preserve anything about the uh, machine? Uh, did you try to get in contact with them? It did cross our minds to do that, but we didn't, unfortunately. So it, Maybe it is you will be surprised if you try. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. Uh, for example, a um, few years back I contacted a guy who was working on the uh, PECOM 32 and PECOM uh, 64 machines back in the 80s and he was uh, quite helpful to explain me some details about those so that is actually a very good proposition. Thank you. We, we will only need to find some uh, older workers there who, who remember still what team was actually at back in the days. Uh, so, what happened uh, with uh, Team uh, 020? Uh, well, Team 020 was actually, if I remember correctly, uh, an XT clone. So, uh, those machines were also made for schools. Uh, I don't know if they were sold uh, as uh, uh, for private owners, uh, but uh, they do not have anything uh, similar with this machine except the case. I think they use the similar or the same case, but inside it is a, is a classic uh, IBM compatible machine. Uh, they also made uh, Team 030, if I remember correctly, and that one was 386 computer. Any other questions? Yeah, but can it run Doom? Because essentially it's Z Z80, so maybe some of us can work on and create a Doom. Uh, actually, there is a, a version of Doom for Zetic Spectrum uh, that runs relatively fast. Uh, it could probably be adapted to this computer, but then we will need someone who knows Z80 assembly much, much better than I do and does, does not hate it. 
But I, I think it is possible only. I do not think that it could run full screen because, uh, for example, just erasing the whole screen takes about half a second or around a second. So uh, you would need to play with with much smaller uh, window to actually get any kind of animation on it. Yeah, I will re uh, I will reset the machine now so you can see actually the speed that the, the screen gets erased. And that is at full speed of the processor. Yeah. Uh, as I said, I, I think it could be made in some, uh, for example, a quarter of the screen or something like that. But we need some, someone to do it. OK. Then thank you very much for listening. I hope that you learned some um, interesting pieces of the Yugoslav computer history. And uh, maybe at uh, next Balcon, we will be able to show you some new games for the machine. But I cannot promise anything. Thank you very much.